We are recording, Kevin. Oh, thank you. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, this month's installment of uh, Library Lunch and Learns author series. I'm Kevin Bradford, research and writing support librarian here at the campus in Suwannee. And our special guest uh, for today's um, segment is Dr. Rachel Malibu. And uh, Dr. Malibu is a uh, PCOM alumnus, I think that's how you would say it, of uh, in, in 2002, and she's currently practicing as an emergency medicine in Glen Burnie, Maryland, and is affiliated with some multiple hospitals in the area, including MedStar Franklin Square Medical Center and University of Maryland, Baltimore. Um, and uh, the, the, the book that we're going to be discussing is a small book collection of poems that uh, that uh, Rachel has uh, written that deal with a, a topic that uh, uh, is is a difficult one, is a challenging one, and is not dealt with uh, as perhaps in, a, in an intimate way that it, that it should. And uh, I I found the, the the poetry collection amazing, and I can't uh, wait to uh, hear Rachel talk about it. So without further ado, Rachel, I'll hand uh, the reins over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody who it, who has come to hear me talk about poetry. I know that's not a typical thing that um, medical professionals usually talk about, and probably not a typical thing that most medical professionals do. Um, I did study English before I became a doctor. My undergraduate degree is actually uh, in English. And I just took the prerequisites and did go straight to medical school. That was quite a, quite a difference in education. Um, poetry, I think a lot of people, especially that aren't familiar with it or didn't study it, people just think about rhymes. They think about meter. We remember Shakespeare, maybe, well, iambic pentameter. Um, that's not the kind of poetry I write. That's not the kind of poetry that probably most people write these days. Uh, it's more kind of a, a free verse, not limiting uh, the line cuts in ways that what might make you think or linger about a word or a thought. Um, so if you, if you joined in thinking I was going to give you some rhyme things, uh, you're probably in luck because, because I'm not. And then I guess I'm just going to explain a little bit about how I ended up writing. Obviously, I wrote a lot when I was an English major. Um, but then went straight to medical school, which, you know, is a, a touch challenging. And so I probably didn't have as much time as I wanted. And my father, who's also a doctor, kept on telling me, right, right, you're seeing things you'll never see. You're doing things, you know, you'll never do for the first time again. And maybe I have some scattered little fragments in notebooks. Well, you remember when we used to carry little notebooks in our pockets? Um, I still have those and I have some fragments of things, but I wasn't really good about writing. And then I went straight into emergency medicine residency, which I would say was probably even a little more challenging. Um, and again, was seeing things that now when, you, you know, anybody who's a medical professional, when you think about the things you saw for the first time, it's kind of shocking because most people in this world won't see the things we do or they see at one time, like Damar Hamlin having a cardiac arrest and, and they're so shaken by it. And this is stuff that we had to deal with again and again and again. I did very little writing then as well, just because I was so busy. And then I ended up having my first child in residency and then had like three more. So then I, not in residency, as I was a young attending. So I ended up you know, with, with four sons and was working full-time nights so I could be around for the sons. And I'd say in 2014, my youngest son slipped out of the house and somehow, don't know how, he got into our pool and he uh, had a near fatal drowning. And I will ne obviously never forget that day. My husband, who's also a physician, is the one who found him in the pool. And I remember hearing a scream that I've never heard in my life since. And the minute he made that sound, I actually, I knew what had happened. I ran out, he was just screaming my name. And my husband didn't start CPR, I don't know why, but I ran right, right out. 
grabbed my child. He was 21 months old and I resuscitated him um, and just really snapped into a super doctor emergency mode, didn't cry. You know, I'm like, call 911. That's all I remember telling my husband. Then I was just like super calmly resuscitating him thinking I had the steps like I would in the emergency department. Well, if this doesn't work. For some reason, I thought I could intubate him at home. I, I don't know why I thought that, but I was thinking I would. Um, thankfully, he did come back. He fully resuscitated. We had a couple rough nights, but he um, recovered with no sequelae. It was miraculous. He was down a long time and he recovered. I probably for six weeks, I didn't cry in anything. Um, got really, really numb, had some really bad, probably now looking back, PTSD, didn't seek help because I'm a yeah, doctor, and finally started writing. And through that writing, was able to finally deal with it. Probably wrote about him drowning for a, a year straight and started to finally banish the images. And then I like to joke now that like I'm contractually obligated to put in a drowning scene and probably one out of every five people, <laughs> just because it obviously shaped my life in ways that anybody who's lost or almost lost a child would understand. And when, as I finally got disciplined about writing again, um, I then began to just delve into the things I was doing, um, wrote for a few years, started to get some, you know, a little bit of success with publishing, had no idea what to do. I'm like super a homeschooled poet, um, just was writing my experiences and my, you know, my life basically. And then the pandemic happened. And then suddenly I had a whole lot of new first experiences as an emergency physician during this time that we were all walking through for the first time together. And that really, really kind of forced me to be disciplined and finally did um, get a book finished last spring in 2022, um, shopped at a lot of places and found a publisher. And that is how this book came to be. And um, Kevin, I don't know if you want me to just go ahead and read a few poems to start. I don't know if you have anything that you particularly want to ask me. You tell me what you want me to do. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, I read I read through the, the book and I was interested in your title poem piece that goes along with the title of the uh, of the book, A History of Resurrection. And um, I uh, one of the jobs that I had to do to put myself through school, I was a home health aide, and uh, my patients were hospice cases who were all, um, you know, determined to be, you know, 12 months or, or less before their passing. And on one of my shifts, I had uh, arrived on shift, and my patient Raymond had passed. And so it was my duty to provide postmortem care for this, for this very gentle man. He was a retired banker. And there are some portions and pieces of your poetry, which hits me directly. And the thing that, that I was most in, uh, impressed with is that we don't think about our own deaths much. Um, and, and when we do, we typically don't think of the person whose job it's going to be to provide that last service for us. And I'm like, well, I was that person to this man who had passed. And I was like, it was a very... Um, it was a kind of a scary experience for me because I wasn't expecting to have to be to do that. So, you know, as as an ER physician, you're called upon to do things much more uh, troublesome and, and challenging than that. But I was really struck with that thinking. I was like, the person who's going to provide that service for us, there's some he's he or she is probably out there, and that on that one day we will our lives will intersect in a way. So it's like it was very kind of a spiritual sort of a thing for me. I think I wonder if the poem. So history of resurrection is the when I uh, gave Narcan to the same drug addict two times in one night, um, and then so that that is actually based on absolutely true experience. I didn't even say all the horrible things she said to me. She was oh. really mad. I brought her back. Um, and then the, the poem that I think uh, addresses kind of the things about happen after our death is a poem after, um, which, you know, is just 
that I don't know got me thinking, well, it's just that yeah, so many times I pronounced the deaths during the pandemic, we started having a moment, we should have probably done this earlier, but we started having a moment of silence each time someone died, just kind of center it, center them as a human, center ourselves as part of the process. And in that moment, I would often just place my hand on that, um, on that man or woman's shoulder and think, okay, this was a person but then, I mean, we're talking 10 seconds and then all of a sudden all the things start, you know, that you have to do because that room, I mean, someone else needs it. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's, it's really kind of shocking how quickly we turn mm -hmm. these rooms over and in doing so turn ourselves over, um, you know, especially in emergency medicine to go from pronouncing someone dead, telling the family, you know, doing all that, dealing, you know, think, oh my, a human died. And then you immediately just walk out and you do something else. And someone is usually yelling at you because you didn't bring them a sandwich. So that's, you know, that's true story too. Um, so those are, you know, just kind of the moments that I try to explore, um, you know, with my poetry is, the, is those moments that maybe nobody would understand because they haven't thought about them or they haven't been in that room. And I'd be happy to read either one of those, the, A History of Resurrection, which is about giving um, the, the drug addict Narcan twice in a night or the one about cleaning up after death, if there's, or both, whichever, you know. Both would be great. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Hearing the poem in the author's uh, voice is really helpful to try to understand. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to read uh, A History of Resurrection, which was from a, a true experience. Everyone marveled when Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead. But on a hot night in August, I resurrected the same junkie twice in one shift. When someone pushed her out of the car a second time, she still wore the gauze and tape in the crook of her left elbow where we'd so recently placed the IV. This time, the Narcan worked so slowly that I had a blade in her mouth, ready to push the breathing tube. Then her eyes flew open. She pushed my hand away. Thanks for nothing, bitch. Next time, let me die. Before Lazarus was resurrected, his sisters wailed and mourned. Overcome by the brutal humanity of it all, afflictions, heartache, the certitude of death, Jesus wept. After he wept, Jesus prayed, for he knew that raising Lazarus would lead many to faith. And each time that I am brought another addict who is still in blue, I offer silent prayers while searching for a vein, though it is hard for me to keep the faith. I ready the antidote, but even Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead only once. Mm -hmm. And I was really trying to wrestle with that feeling of being like caring. It's hard to keep on caring. And, you know, I've been in emergency medicine. I guess I've been an attending since uh, 06. So it's been a long time. Um, and I don't ever want to be one of those people that gets hard or gets cynical because it just actually really just annoys me. Um, I don't, I feel like that's a choice that we make. And I understand compartmentalizing and I understand like having to get you know, protect yourself and maybe, maybe you don't have the most emotions in the world. But on the other hand, it's like really frustrating when somebody that you, whose life you just saved wakes up and starts swinging and cursing and, you know, telling you horrible things. Um, so I was trying to just kind of ex explore that tension of trying to read, you know, to remember, you know, we're all, we're all God's children. We're all here. You know, we're all here. We all have value just by being people, by being alive. But then the frustration of um, actually having to give the Narcan twice in one night. So that, and that was probably one of my earliest poems um, that when I started writing about anything other than my son drowning. And then um, I'll go ahead and read the other one. I think that's probably the one that's in your mind, um, having worked hospice. And this is called After by way of Wislawa Zimborska, who is a poet who wrote um, a poem about kind of what happens after a war. And that was my um, inspiration for this poem. After every death, people have to clean up. The room must be ready for the next person. Someone has to pick up bloody gloves and collect the discarded syringes and gowns. 
Someone will push a mop and wipe urine or vomit or blood from the floor. Someone will mumble, they're always so damn messy and angrily toss the picture that slipped from the dead man's fingers into the trash. Death often leaves a stain. So someone will scrub regrets from his hands and dab I spoken, unspoken I love you's from the corners of his lips. Someone will toss his wallet and cigarettes into a bag but forget to remove his wedding ring. Another will pull a sheet over his face and ask for a moment of silence. Everyone will bow their heads, but only for 10 seconds. On the gurney, stiffening under a starch sheet, someone must gaze toward the ceiling with half-closed eyes and reassure, this only happens to other people. Mm. This is really uh, inspiring stuff. How yeah. is this the bad and, one? and it's, it, I, you know, I, I think it's really, I, I think that's needed to be honest with you because death now is so clinical for the majority of the population who never sees it because we we push them away the dying away in a little in a corner in a clinic and in the old days like maybe mid 1950s before that it was that people died at home right. and uh, there was no escaping some of the 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 process the natural processes such as the death rattle um and and other aspects of 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 the body shutting down so you know it, it comes to us all and you know i, I try to, to be reflective in, in light of that yes i mean it's it's it, our turn will come but can we make something maybe purposeful out of that can we maybe you know turn the ashes into a rose or something, you know, how do we do that? You know, is it be, is there something beyond mere catharsis for you to write about these, these topics? Um, I, I'd say a lot of it is catharsis to be honest, or at least that's the way it started. And then, um, as I started to submit and as I wrote my book, I, I did realize that kind of like you said, there's a dearth of things on this topic, especially art on this topic, and especially from people that understand it and that have lived it. And that just for the reason that like ER was po a popular show or Grey's Anatomy, people really want that window lifted and they really wanna understand like what, what's going on, what's going on in the emergency room behind those doors, what's going on with our doctors. I did feel that there was a great curiosity and I had a way of kind of, uh, lifting the veil or parting the veil to let people know, you know what we not only just what we do but what happens to them how we feel about it yeah um you know right that it comes for all of us I just feel like this book is not super uplifting like there are moments of hope and I feel bad about that but that's also the you know the world that I've I've right. lived in and dealt with and I think part of that poem too after um, I mean, as a, as an emergency physician, a lot of, you just see every horrible thing. Right. And mm -hmm. then I go and have, I actually have five kids now. So you go and you put five children out into the world. So you just put five parts of your heart, just up there all at school right now, two of them drove just out there. And I have to be able to function and not sit around worrying like, oh my, you know, what's going to happen to my kids, mm. Is my husband to make it home. So you do totally compartmentalize like, oh no, that just happens to other people. You know, like that doesn't, which is why I think they say emergency department. No, I'm not like that. But a lot of them are like do super high risk things and they skydive and all this stuff because mm. have that like, oh yeah, sure. I'm invincible because I'm the one who does this. Mm. It just happens. And then, you know, in my last job, I'm actually not at Franklin Square anymore. I'm at uh, Baltimore Washington Medical Center. But our boss, who was a young, and he was only 50 when he died, which is not very far off from where I am now, um, he died a horrible protracted death of, of cancer in front of us. And that was the first time that I had seen, you know, just one of my colleagues die and all the things that he and actually one of my other colleagues he did die at home and one of my other colleagues was there with him for two days while he died so that a stranger wouldn't have to pronounce the death no. so that he would have a friend with him you know holding his hand the entire time and so having walked through that then you start to okay well that well, this might happen to me but what do we do with that and I do agree with you about putting beauty in the world and um 
I have a new book I'm working on and that's more about being a mother. Uh, so it's, there are <laughs> it's certainly still some challenges, but um, maybe not as much death. So I'm, I'm trying to, you know, move beyond, you know, expand my repertoire. Rachel, we have a, a couple of questions, uh, Carmela Matthews and then Will Anderson. So if you guys would unmute. Hi, Rachel. Um, first of all, I enjoy both of the poems, especially the one about uh, Jesus and the resurrection from Lazarus. That was excellent. Um, what I wanted to say is, um, you know, when I was younger, I was afraid of death. I think we all don't like to talk about it because it's something like, to me, it seems like it was very spooky. Well, I come to realize, but it's not because we're only here when it's over temporary. That's what my the Bible tells me. We only hear temporary. We're just passing by. And, you know, I learned how to accept death. I always talk about it, even talk about with my daughter, what happens, what, you know, I need you to know this. So, and I also, um, my husband passed away. I was right there when he died. My mother passed away. I was right there. So death to me, it's like, wow. Like, it's like, okay, I understand it. And I think when you see it, when you, and, and then you saw your son, you was in the middle of it. And thank God he, he, you know, revived, revived it. You've seen the glory and what God can do. So I just want to say to everyone, we do have to talk about death, even with your family, your family members, your, who, you know, anyone, we should talk about it because we, we're not going to be here. <laughs> this is not our home. We only pass them by. You know, so I, I appreciate both the poems because it gave me some enlightenment into your testimony that you gave. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Will? Yeah. Hey, um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Malibu, for doing this. Um, I have your book in my Amazon cart, so I um, haven't read it yet, but I plan on it. Um, <laughs> so I um, you were a writer before you came to medical school. Um, I was an investigator. Um, I am a, a board certified medical legal death investigator. So for um, several years uh, before I came to school, um, I worked in that field and um, in that role, you know, I, I never got a resurrection. Um, that makes sense, not to get too personal, but you know, I, I didn't get the, drug addict who uh, who got Narcan in time. I got the other one. I didn't get the child who was successfully, who was saved from a swimming pool. I got the other one. Um, I didn't get the gunshot wound victim who made it to the ED in time. Um, and so, and that, that kind of gives a distorted perspective on, on, on what happens, you know, and, and I, I continue, I intend to continue sort of in that path in forensic pathology um, and sort of retaining my humanity was was a little difficult at certain points during that time. Um, and I, I appreciated some of what you had to say of like, uh, you know, when you're in it and the, and the sort of the narrowing of the perspective that can that can occur. Um, I'm just gonna say something just after that. I lost my train of thought, I apologize. Um, the, uh, oh yeah, happens to other people, right? So that was sort of how it felt for a long time and you know a lot of what you do after death is of course not really for the the dead person it's for the living it's for the family you know you're helping them heal helping them find justice closure peace whatever it may be um and you know making those calls um to notify someone that their loved one had passed unexpectedly you know i i set off the domino that started the worst day of some people's lives um and i didn't fully understand that until I got that phone call three times in three years um, for people that were my age. Um, and that had a profound uh, impact on how I interacted with people in those times um, and how I understood it. Um, and also just, um, you know, it, it, after those incidences, you know, my, my own death anxiety came up um, much more uh, prominently. And I think that some of what, you know, Kevin said and um, what Carmela said, um, I talk about a lot. Um, I think it's important to have more frank conversations about death. Um, and I would say 
you know, the work that you're doing, the writing that you're doing is, is contributing to that because, yeah, we don't have to look at it anymore. As a society, we turn our face away. Um, as Kevin said, people used to die at home. You, as a child, you would see your grandparents die at home. Um, on the interstate, you would see the hearses, you know, moving, moving people around, moving, moving the bodies around. Now, you probably drive next to them almost every day. They're in unmarked Chrysler minivans. You would never know. Um, we turn our face away. And by doing that and by making it this mysterious thing that, you know, we don't look at or talk about or think about, all of a sudden it becomes scary. And so I think doing what you're doing and writing about it um, and having frank discussions about it is incredibly important because what that does is it brings that anxiety down. It says death is natural um, and it's not to be feared. Um, so um, oh, I just want to share some, some of myself. And thank you again. Thank you. Wow, mm -hmm. thank you for the work you do. Cause I know that phone call I actually have a poem about that it, or that notification is probably the worst, the worst part of my job. And I'm, sh and obviously the worst part of yours. And those are the parts that take pieces of your soul away. And what do you do to get that back? You know, and at, <laughs> you take care of yourself, you exercise, you know, you just, you do what you can, you, you engage with others, but those, that is really hard. So yeah. thanks, thanks for that as well. Of course, yeah. And in that moment, you can't say, this is really hard for me. Because no. a thousand <laughs> times harder for that that's, yeah, that's a problem, right. And you have things to do. You have to process later, uh -huh. which is, you know, I do that's things to process hard. myself. And it, it seems mm -hmm. like, okay, is that for you? So I'm, I'm Without glad. drinking, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's good to be candid about that, too. Yeah. No, exactly. I agree. And I actually, if you want, I do have just, just on what Will was speaking about. Um, I have a poem that kind of talks about who I was before I became a doctor when I was just this like little underground, undergrad English major. So, I mean, my word to describe me in my senior yearbook of high school was melodramatic, which is really funny because I'm like the exact opposite now. I would like, now I just say, I don't have any huge range of emotions. Um, and I have a poem kind of about making that tr transition from an English major to somebody who, who starts the worst day of people's lives. Oh, that'd be great. That? Okay. This one's called My Life. I found my old journals in the closet under the stairs and sat on the basement floor to read, falling in love with the girl who wrote them. She hiked at night and envisioned ribbons of moonlight tangled in dark streams. She wept when she read Elie Wiesel. Her hands went cold when she heard the Alleluia Dies Sanctificatus. I could almost remember the taste of her tears and feel her pulse when I touched my wrist. But I need to tell you what happened last night. A woman came in bleeding and when I examined her, a baby slipped out in a gush of blood. I caught him. His body only filled my palm and his legs dangled toward my elbow. He waved his hand and took uneven gulps of air. She, so racked with grief and anger, would not hold him, so I did, until his heart no longer beat beneath his translucent, translucent skin. She wept then, a mother twice, but also never. And soon after, an ambulance brought me a young man whose face was swollen from the peanuts which stopped his heart and closed his lungs. I tried, tried for over an hour, but I could not keep him here. And then his mother arrived, and I informed her that her son was dead. She told me I was wrong. Her hands trembled as she found a picture to prove to me it was not her boy, but I was not mistaken. And when she finally went to see him, she wailed, that's my baby, and lowered the bed, bed rail to climb onto the gurney and better hold him. Maybe now you'll understand what I mean when I say sometimes I feel cord, my insides filled with sawdust. And why, when I got home that morning, I crawled into bed with my youngest son. And because I was so cold, I wrapped my arms around his oven of a body. But even then, I did not cry. <clears throat> and that's a little bit of a lie because actually that, that really happened. Almost sadly, almost all these things are rooted somewhat in truth. Um, that, those two patients happened to me on the same night. And after I pronounced the second one before I went, or no, I think after I brought the mom back and I signed the death certificate so she could, um, she could touch him. Um, 
I went to the bathroom and I actually cried, which I would say I could probably count on one hand what's happened in 20 years of, ima- of emergency medicine. Cause, cause like Will said, you can't, you don't get to fall apart. It doesn't matter how sad it is. It doesn't matter how horrible you feel. Um, and so that was, that was a, I did actually cry, but then you get home and then you just feel totally and completely numb, um, which is probably maybe part of the reason I write, like you said, is it all catharsis or is it me? I mean, some of it is just to, to retain my, my humanity and my sensitivity, sensitivity towards others. I like the, the reference to the music because um, I find it transcendent and spiritual, even if I'm not in a, a particular advocate of any, any organized religion like, like Roman Catholic um, liturgy, I really, really love Eastern Orthodox chants. Yeah. And I'm about as far from, from that uh, faith tradition and culture as one can get. And yet there is something that I think is, is transcendent and holy uh, in the moment and listening to that. Definitely. It looks like maybe somebody else has a question. Bettina. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. You never know with Zoom. Um, I I was very moved by what you just read there, um, uh, Rachel. Uh, Very moved. And also worried being a psychiatrist because (laughs) such overwhelming secondary trauma that you're exposed to every day. And I wondered, you know, obviously the writing is is quite, sounds like hopefully quite cathartic. Um, but I wondered, you know, like as a as a team there with your 10 minutes of silence, that, you know, that's, um, so, so from all the studies of resiliency that I have read and, you know, been involved in, um, you know, the idea is that you have this zone uh, where you live, where you're comfortable, you know, and then when you're outside your zone, when you're like either overstimulated or understimulated, that's where the problem comes in. And, you know, you can expand your zone only so much at any one time, but, you know, the, the, the 10 seconds of, you know, taking time to, uh, kind of be, be silent and be quiet and all that, that down regulates everything. But it sounds to me like maybe, I hope you're not offended by me (laughs) saying this to you, but when you feel like sawdust, that maybe you're under-regulated actually, and you need something to pep you up. Mm -hmm. Um, And so some of the Eastern traditions and even Western traditions to some degree involve things that move the body, you know, like shaking or dancing or jumping jacks or something like that. And I just wondered with your whole team of people, because I, that's what, when you were, you know, reading these these poems I envision it's not just you but you also have your whole team there in the emergency department um you know is there anything you do like you know my my fantasy is on Grey's Anatomy you know how they dance it out um do you do anything like that or have you ever thought of anything like that and and thank you again very much very moving your your poem brought tears to my eyes oh thank you um well one I want to say that the narrator is not or the the writer the the narrator is not always a complete representation of who I am. So I do take care of myself in the emergency department. There just isn't time. I mean, honestly, that 10 seconds sometimes feels like too much and that's horrible, but it is what it is. I'm in the second busy at, I think we're the first, I, I'm the two hospitals I've worked at in Maryland have like exchanged being first and second busiest in Maryland. So apparently I'm like doing that. Um, so we're the, we're the busiest emergency department in Maryland. We have, you know, 50 people in the waiting room. Um, we, we call a desk and we, we go on, we move on with our day. I mean, I just, I, I just have too many people to take care of. I do take care of myself at home though. Um, I work out, I would say probably six days a week. Um, I can't do all the things I used to when I was younger, which was a lot of like high intensity interval training. So all kinds of body movement and jumping and crazy stuff. But I do hike in the woods with my dog almost every day. And that for me, and I think some of my, this is, you know, my first book of poetry. Some of these poems are five, six years old. Um, Some of my uh, more recent poetry is, is kind of probably more centered and, 
and there's gravity there. And it's because I am in the woods. I love nature. I love hiking probably than almost anything other than my family. Um, and being out there and being with my dog and being in nature is kind of what keeps me centered and keeps me human. And then I sit there and I process as not, and as I process these things thinking, I often end up writing out of them, but no, we definitely don't dance it out. I mean, that's a <laughs> wonderful idea, but, um, I mean, my movement is that I don't sit down. I don't eat. Maybe I don't go to the bathroom. So <laughs> we don't sit either. Barbara Wood asks a question. Are you a spiritual or religious person, Rachel? So I would have to say yes. I think probably you would, you know, if you read the book, it would be hard to come to any other conclusion. Um, I was raised in the Christian tradition. I still definitely identify as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. I've become a little unhappy with a, a lot of the American church in the last few years, but I still um, do, you know, I, I do follow Jesus. I do read the Bible. Um, and that would be probably um, the religion that influences me the most. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? We're at 1237. I'll, I'll leave this to you, Rachel, if you wanted to read us another passage. I'll read one more. I have one um, that I wrote probably a month into the pandemic when we didn't know anything, when we didn't know if we were going to die. I mean, it was just now you look back, it's three years later almost, and it's so casual. I mean, I've had COVID now three times. It's just like, oh, okay. My kids, uh, two of them just got over it. They had it last week. But at the beginning, it was really scary and really weird. And we didn't have many people coming into the emergency department because everyone stayed home. But although, I mean, so many people that came in ended up on ventilators. And so my emergency department turned into this strange, eerie ICU where you'd walk through and you'd see 15, 20 people on vents. Our ICUs were full. This was, you know, as we got into it, as it hit Maryland. And there was just so much fear there. And this is, I'm going to preface this poem with saying you know, my father's a physician who worked emergency medicine kind of on the side for many years. And I, he grabbed me and he used to work at Franklin Square well before I did. He grabbed me when I was 17. I put on a white coat and I followed him for the day when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And he, uh, there was a cardiac arrest and he pronounced the death. And then I watched him go tell the family and I don't know how this was back then. I guess you could just do these things with a white coat on. Um, and then he told me afterwards kind of how you tell the family or and whether you, in, you know, how he told the family someone was dead. But then he also told me always tell them like if someone's dying, give them the worst case scenario. Just put them in the ground is what he'd say. Put them in the ground. Because if you're wrong, they're not going to be mad at you. And if you're right, you told them. And it's funny because you don't really get training on that. At least I didn't. Or if I did, I don't remember it. In medical school, how to talk to patients and then how to tell people like, you know, this is your worst day. Your, your family member is probably going to die. So I was kind of thinking through all of that. And then this was kind of um, the first 2020 the pandemic started and I think in March, and it all kind of fell into Easter as well. So I'm going to read um, Dust, which kind of, you know, the touches on religious themes again, as well as the fear that we had, as well as like, you know, all these people who were critically ill, which was kind of overwhelming at the time. At night, I no longer kiss my children for fear the errant wind of my bedtime prayer carries disillusion. I am dust. My particulates hang deadly in the room. I didn't give up anything for Lent, and then I gave up everything. No ashes on my forehead, but rather on my tongue, my mouth parched behind the mask. If this Friday is still good, this seal will hold. I am faceless. I stop smiling at patients, but I'm close enough to kiss them when I place the blade in their mouths and search for the pale glisten of cords when I pass the breathing tube. Last week, there was still time, so I let him call his son. He wept and said, I love you, then swore it wouldn't be long before they spoke again. I never make promises I can't keep. It's simpler to say he will die. And if miraculously he does not, 
no one ever begrudges a resurrection. And I am actually happy to say that that man survived. And I it would not have called that guy surviving COVID a million times over. I did um, intubate him. He had a prolonged course, but he actually left the hospital. So. Wow. wow, that's so profound. Any other questions or comments from the audience? Thank you all for attending. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Rachel, from Thank the you. bottom of my heart. And, and many blessings to you. And we we do have a copy of your, your book in the library. Thank you. So for anyone who wants to check that out. Thank you so much. And thanks bye for bye. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye-bye.